um, for the sake of any visitor in this uh, sanctuary, my name is Samuel Gidaiga, the vicar of the parish, and I go right to presenting God's word. I will be doing recognition thereafter. Uh, we have launched our theme, The Transforming Grace, with a rider amazing encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. So we will be breaking this theme into various topics. And the first one is what we offered online, which is an expected life transforming request. An expected life transforming request. That is the, the, uh, the topic of today. Now, with, uh, I think I'm having many riders. So the rider for this is when the master says, give me. So, giving is the core of all transformations. And I want to pause here and say, are you in need of a miracle? Then pray. Yes, I heard a yes. <laughs> if you're in need of a miracle, pray. But if you're in need of transformation, you need to go beyond prayer. Give. When you wake up and go to work and do it selflessly, that is what we call work and it is giving, isn't it? And selfless work is transformational. Uh, we are mourning death of uh, Lise Wanyoike, who happened in this uh, few last years to be a member of his church. And posthumously, uh, we can honor her as a woman who transformed, isn't it? And she gave. She did it because she gave. Now, in a very simpler way, I can relate to this emotionally, financially. This year, I have just released my firstborn daughter to the high school. It was very emotional. I'm still feeling the emptiness. I felt like I have given, but for transformation, isn't it? If she didn't go, I think I, would, I will not talk about transformation. Do you know my small boy called Jaden? I have also released him to school. <laughs> He's now in school, yes. And uh, the first day we took her with mom, handed her to the teacher and she, he was running away coming back to us. And it left a very emotional feeling in me. I was traveling and every evening I kept on calling Christine and asking, her, how is Jaden? Well, you have to give for transformation to happen. Yes. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. I think that's the way I introduced my sermon this morning. John chapter 4, 1 to 14 was read to us. And verse 4 has something that is key. If I can have it on screen, verse 4 of John 4. Uh, 1 to 14, verse 4. Can you read it with me? Now that is NIV. From, uh, from New King James Version it says, but he needed to go through Samaria. Now he had to go through Samaria, but he needed to go through Samaria. Now, why that? That's about Jesus Christ. Why? when it becomes a need for God to go a given way. Why? Now, let me give you a background. There existed a deep dislike and distrust between Jews and Samaritans for many years. So deep that coming from Jerusalem to Galilee, Jews had to avoid the shorter route which was through Samaria and take a longer way into the region beyond 
Jordan. Those of you who have gone to the Holy Land, maybe quickly you're trying to map out that. Now why, and maybe to bring it into perspective, you may have had a neighbor that probably you don't see eye to eye, and therefore, instead of passing through that neighbor's, you go a long way. That is exactly how the Jews used to do for many years. The reason was Samaritans were half cast between Jews and other tribes. Okay, they were half castes. Now, being half castes made them influenced, uh, they were influenced by the laws of Moses. So they embraced the Torah, but also combined it with superstitions from other cultures. Now, for a Jew, that was not acceptable. It is, was either Judaism or not. And for that reason, they felt that they are not part of us. In fact, it is said, Jews embraced Gentiles more than they embraced their half-caste brothers and sisters. Now, this uh, triggered a very serious dislike from Jews to an extent that in 128 BC, the Jews burnt down the temple of Samaritans, built to Yahweh on Mount Gerizim. Why? Because they felt that they are dishonoring the name of God by mixing worship of Yahweh with other superstition beliefs. Now, this clearly informs us why Jesus had to pass through Samaria. So going back to that verse, now he had to go through Samaria. Bonus, if you will. Now you understand? He had to go through there. Why? Because he had a deep concern for these marginalized and rejected people of God. That was a moment of grace. He was to take that moment of grace to the Samaritans. Now, the Samaritans did not deserve a visit by Jesus Christ. If all the Jewish laws and uh, traditions were to be applied, they didn't deserve that visit because Jesus' tradition, uh, culturally, was a Jew. However, God's grace spotted the Samaritans. I pray that as we talk about this amazing grace, May that grace support you regardless of what situation or circumstances, a circumstance that you could be because God is not an honor of personalities. He's God for all the people. Buona sefiwe. Now the Samaritan woman now comes into picture. So you can imagine a Samaritan woman coming from Samaritans. Samaritans are already rejected. But she had double rejection. Why? Because this woman was an outcast. Now, how do you prove that she was an outcast? The fact that she even came to draw water alone was a proof that truly really she was an outcast. Remember, as it, will be, it is exposed after in John chapter 4, this woman is, you know, when she had a discourse with Jesus, she was asked, go and bring your husband. What did she say? I have no. And Jesus said, I know you have had how many? And even the one you are having is not So, whose husband was he? The one she had. It was someone's husband, isn't it? Now, you can see why she was avoided by other women. She wasn't a good lady. You know, traditionally, women would go to draw water early in the morning. This woman was going to draw water alone at midday. When other women have already on home. So this is not a good woman. By all standards, she wasn't good. 
But may I surprise you, this is the woman that Jesus will meet at the well. Hallelujah. And it is so strategically put so, so that his grace is focused on the worst. Hallelujah. So that no one would say that I am excluded from the grace of God. We stand here in this year to say grace for all. And no one will be included from that grace because this is a blessing of God. Amen? Now, we may stand here with shameful situations surrounding us. Let me tell you, when the grace of God comes, you become a candidate of transformation. May we expect that transformation. Now, the life-changing request is actually in verse 4, where Jesus asked the Samaritan woman, give me a drink. Give me a drink. That is what she, he asks. So Jesus was thirsty. I'm saying the giver of life was thirsty. The one who says, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavily laden, and I will give you rest, was weary. So, what happens when he who gives a drink asks you for a drink? What happens when he who relieves you from weariness, tells you, I am weary. What do you do? So he comes and says, give me a drink. So the question is, why is he thirsty? John chapter 1 verse 14, the Bible says that Jesus is the word made flesh. And, the, and you know, John chapter 1 still, a little earlier, John had said that the word is God. So if you say, Jesus is a word made flesh. So we say, Jesus is God made flesh. Now, what does that mean to us? Because we are the flesh. It means he is God identifying with us. When God decides to come to your level, he identifies with you. So when you're thirsty, he also gets thirsty. Praise be to God. That is humility. And when divine humility happens, then grace is released. Now, that reminds me of Isaiah 55, verse 11. Because Isaiah, give me that very fast. Isaiah 55, verse 11. Isaiah 55, that verse 11. Help me read. So, Now, for, the, for God's word to come down, it is God himself coming down. For God's word to interact with the flesh, it is God himself interacting with flesh. And this is what he says. That will never happen in vain. Hallelujah. I am God and I will not interact with the flesh in vain. My grace has to transform. Praise be to God. I'm asking us this morning to look into this question. Give me a drink. But then, why would God say, give me? I just quickly thought through what we are into as a nation. We uh, into a moment of taxations after taxations after taxations.
accusations, isn't it? And there are a lot of laments from every corner until you're no longer calling president by his name. I know you're calling him Zakai. Is he Zakai? <laughs> feel like this guy is pushing things down our throat. Actually, uh, I heard the LSK, one of those guys, quote the guy in America who, when he was being killed, he was saying, you know, they can't, they can't remove their knee off me, isn't it? You remember that, eh? So, and they were saying, this guy has his knees on us. We can't breathe. And that is what people are saying. We can't. <laughs> but he is so steadfast and he's saying, we must transform. Is that what he's saying? We must. My prayer is that may that transformation happen. Then we will forget our pain. But let me tell you something before you judge that. There is no transformation without giving. I'm not sent here by President Ruto. <laughs> <laughs> but for every transformation to happen, I pray that our politicians use our money rightly. Because there is no transformation without giving. The only difference when it comes to giving to God is he does not force it. Are we together? But for the president, because he knows that you cannot give voluntarily, he has to force it. But God does not force it. Giving to God, number one, confirms your trust in him. It confirms your trust in God. Number two, it exercises, it helps you exercise obedience. Number three, it helps you build relationship that he has already initiated. Hello? And then number four, it becomes a bridge towards transformation. Now, one who encounters with Jesus Christ must expect a transformative request from him and that request is give me give me when the master says give me he's asking not for the least but the highest of price the Samaritan woman faced a heavy cost and the heavy cost was extending kindness to a Jewish man. How? You are a Jew. I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? How now? How? To make the master worse in a broad daylight. You want people to think that I have another one? How? If you had come by night, I'm sure you should not have minded the conversation. But how in this time a cost to pay? Could this be why people of God, it becomes so hard even for many of us to give our lives to Jesus Christ? Because life is costly, isn't it? Life is? Yes. I'm very sure the many lives here are given in pledge. You know, when you're given pledge, you'll pay it later. Because there is so much you have to meet before you release it. It is costly. Uh, I'm sorry, giving in pledge will not help before God. Now, verse 10 of John, uh, the book of John chapter 4, Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that ask you, asks you to drink, for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, don't take it away 
if you knew the gift of God. Now, I need to say there that Jesus Christ is a gift of God. Amen? Because he is the word, which is God, made flesh and given to you and me. So he is the gift of God to you. Who is Jesus Christ? The gift of God to me. God telling yourself today, there is a gift of God that you have, which is Jesus Christ, who is the word of God made flesh. And James chapter 1 and verse 7 says, every good and perfect gift comes from above. Jesus Christ is a good and perfect gift for you. Hallelujah. That is why he's saying, if you knew the gift of God and who, is, who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you the living water. So, that is what transformation is about. God will ask you for something precious from you. But remember, it is all geared towards creating a relationship which leads to transformation. Let me talk about giving to God, or rather, as being sacrific sacrificial. I know we didn't do Old Testament reading because we made the time, but if it were to be read, I would have re we would have read Genesis 22. Genesis 22 verse 2, Abraham is asked to sacrifice Isaac as a burnt offering. Isaac was so precious to Abraham, so precious that asking for him was quite a trial. I mean... Abraham was, Isaac was, da, was born by a man and woman at their 190 years respectively. Do we have a 100 years person here? You are decades away from that. Am I right? Yes. Now I'm very sure at the age you are today, if God were to ask you for your son, you'd still resist. Abraham didn't. Hallelujah. Why? Because he trusted in God. He obeyed God. He, had a relation, he needed a relationship strengthened the one with God. He was looking forward for a transformation. In Romans chapter 4 verse 3, the Bible says... Abraham believed in God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now that crediting as righteousness was a transformation. If you look at Genesis 22 verse 15, the Bible says, maybe now you, could give, you can give us the media, Genesis chapter 22 verse 15. Let us read it from the screen. Okay. Oh, I think I have shortened it. Um, so I may not get to what... Is that verse 15, right? Uh, the verse that says, because you have not withheld, that is where I needed, because you have not withheld, because you have not withheld, I will bless you. It continues all the way 15 to 17. I have shortened it. Because you have not withheld, I will bless you. Now, how is this blessing a transformation for Abraham. Number one, he says, I will bless you. I will make you, I will make your descendants as numerous as stars in the sky and as sand in the seashore. That is a blessing of increase of his children. Praise God. <laughs> Some years back, we were made to believe that you cannot have many children because the space is small. And what else? <laughs> and the economy is bad. All right? 
when Abraham didn't have space, he was told, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky. He never even asked God, where will they live? Hello? <laughs> young people here present, thank you for coming to this large service. I know young people today are refusing to get married and being married until they make money. Now, that is not God's way of doing things. Praise God. God starts by increasing you and then he gives you space. There is no way you're going to get a space without increasing. What for? It's a waste. To be a waste. So young people, hi. <laughs> Start increasing in Jesus' name. I'm praying that this year will become the year of your increase. Sawa, sawa. Yes, and that's the space will be provided. Now, number two, he was told, your descendants will take positions, possession of cities of their enemies. Now look at that. There is no way you will take possession of cities of your enemy if you are few. Would you? How would you even acquire it? Hallelujah. So the blessing of increase first, then the blessing of a possession, wealth, territory, that means that increase will come with military prowess and you will move your enemies. Praise be to God. Isn't that transformation? Let me ask you parents. Would you not consider yourself transformed when your children are getting married and marrying? Isn't it? Yes. So this is a blessing to go for. Then finally, he was told, through you, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Those are international relations. Hello? Yes. I will make you an international person. So today, we congregate here because of the faith of one called Abraham. Hallelujah. That is real blessings. Now people think that coming to Christ and be transformed by him makes you so backward. That is not true. Read the history. Okay, cities like, places like the UK, the US, read the history of how they are, the economy grew. There was no growth without revival. There was no growth without the touch of God. You go read those histories. You will know. And when people start coming down, they are coming down because God is not in view. Hallelujah. So the word is, because you have not withheld. Hallelujah. You withhold when you are not quite sure of the outcome. Uh, last week I reasoned to a pastor and she said something so precious because she said in her preaching that walking with God that you do not know can be very dangerous. Why? Because you're walking with God of all blessings, but you live like a pauper. He can only be angry with you. Isn't it? Yes. See, like walking, a child walking with a father, and he's walking in the streets as if he has never been raised by a father who is well to do. That can only be, be dangerous. The same, we need to know our father. The sacrificial aspect of giving to God has priesthood element in it. It has priesthood element in it. How? Because a priest offers a sacrifice and intercedes. So anytime you see us as priests here, we offer sacrifice and we intercede for ourselves and on behalf of others. The offering that you give to God has ability to speak on your behalf and those you present before him if you do it in the right way. So, you know, and I will be, later in the series, I will purely be speaking about giving of offerings. 
So today I'm talking about giving in general. But let me mention it here. Why is it that in every service you must have to come carrying an offering? When we were growing up, we were told you don't go to church without an offering, isn't it? And because there was no enough money, would even go to those makombes, the bands, eh? and you get maize, beans, and as little children, you'd see children carrying that maize in the maize cob to the church, and you throw it into the basket. I, didn't, I don't know what the pastors did with it. But I believe that out of that, may I have the hard copy, please? I believe out of that, they were able to create resources for God's work. But the point I am putting across here, I'm sorry, my gadget is going off. Page four, please. Um, the point I'm putting here to us is that we were taught that you cannot come to God's house empty-hearted. Why? Because at that point of giving, you become a priest. Hello? Buona sifiwe. When you come to offer that gift, you become a priest. On your own behalf, on behalf of your children, on behalf of the people that you'll be interceding for, and you're telling God that this is a sacrifice that I raise before you and this is a transformation I am looking for. Do you understand? Now, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 2, it says, give me that on screen, please. Let's read together. Move on. Thank you. So Romans, in short, it's saying giving must uh, be a, uh, or rather, uh, giving to God must be a sacrifice. But the start sacrifice is a sacrifice of the flesh. So it's saying, give your body living sacrifices. It's a sacrifice of the flesh. Now, let me point out this. That Jesus, the word, became flesh. You remember me saying that. Why did he become flesh? So that he may destroy the sinful work that come with the flesh and raise the work of a spirit within us. Now, the realization of this work of a spirit at individual level depends on whether one is willing to offer their bodies a living sacrifice. So each and every of your giving must come from a body that is offered already as a sacrifice unto the Lord Jesus. When God asks you to give your life to him, he's asking you to offer your body as a living sacrifice. In exchange, he gives you the Holy Spirit. And you can see the verse that we have there at the bottom of the, of the banner. It says, but, whatso, who, but whoever, whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now that water is the Holy Spirit. So the question begs, how is your social life like? Hmm? 
Is it you who is its master of the, or the Holy Spirit? You can transform it by giving it to Jesus. What about your finances and your time? You still can offer it for the master to use them. Now, offering your body calls for interrogation of those areas. The social life, your financials, and your time. Why those? Because they are avenues of manifestation of work of the flesh. If you want to know how much you are in the flesh, look at your social life. Look at your finances. Look at your time, the use of your time. Then you will see how much of the manifestation of the flesh is in you. If you want God to take control of it, he can do it. But it will start by giving out. Hallelujah. That is why she's telling the woman, give me. Even before we are told that he was given water, then the, the next discourse comes in. Go bring your husband. Hello? What is Jesus saying? He's telling her the manifestation of the work of the flesh need to be changed, isn't it? There is something I want to change in you. And it has to interrogate your social life. Please, children of God, do not be ashamed when the Lord squarely looks at you and asks you, how is your life like? He's not out to ashamed you. He's out to help you. Praise be to God. He's out to raise you out. He's out to give you a life and a change. Are we together, people of God? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Now, then, Paul says, when your bodies are offered, that becomes a reasonable or true or proper worship before God. That proper worship brings transformation by the renewal of your, your mind. Look at that relationship between body and the mind. Those of you who are in psychology and you want to handle cognitive issues or be, sorry, behavioral issues, where do you start? With cognitive, isn't it? You start with the mind. You change a person from the mind. Amen. Isn't it? Yes, because once the mind is transformed, the body responds differently. That's it. You can never change the behavior of a child. Those of you who beat children, you don't change behaviors by beating because everything is in the mind. You first of all talk to them, isn't it? You pray for them. That is why prayer is so important because prayer changes your thinking and the thinking of a child and helps you address those children at a different level. Then you talk to them and then they change their behavior so that even where the rod is applied, it is applied justly and in the right way. Now, the last thing I'm going to say is that God changes you by your giving. Now, that may look a little controversial because the Bible says that God's gift is free. But let me tell us something. It is free, but you have to do something about it. Now, we all went to school and we learned something metamorphosis. Did you? Yes, and that cycle, an egg changes into... <laughs> An egg changes into lava, a lava changes into pupa, a pupa changes into a dart. Exactly. Yes, uh, yes. A very basic biology. Now, that pupa, it's a kamdudu we used to, to hold with our hands when we were little children. And <laughs> It was reported that if you asked it, we called it wakaguku. I don't know how you called it at your place. So if you asked wakaguku, where is West? Where is Nairobi? 
So even if you had not gone to Nairobi, you believed where it pointed is actually Nairobi direction. Eh? Now, that can do do the pupa. If you are to break it so that you pull a butterfly out of it, what would happen? What would happen? You destroy, isn't it? And you kill the life. People of God, you cannot change a life of anyone, including yourself. When you try, you destroy it. Praise be to God. So like our, our vision, and we'll be putting up next week, you'll find it in, on the wall also, not, not the theme. Our vision, our vision for the next five years strategic plan is Christ-centered church transforming what? Lives. I would plead with you for God masses. Please note, you cannot change anyone. I know you have tried to change yourself probably. You have failed. Unasema hii mwaka. Haki zita kunywa tena. And then you give yourself the last bottle. <laughs> okay? Then all of a sudden you're like, ah, I met next year. <laughs> because you can't change yourself. Sindio, it's hard. It's very hard. Very hard. A friend of mine, you know, told me how he had resolved to stop smoking. He was getting embarrassed, smoking before grandchildren. And one of the grandchild had confronted her. And he decided not to smoke for like two weeks. Then somehow he relapsed. I asked him, how did it happen? He told me, you know, Vika, I just had a hallucination meeting with the ancestors. <laughs> <laughs> so there is no way I'm going to meet the ancestors at this time. So I had to go back. Friends, you can't change yourself. And no matter what you're going through, no matter what challenges you're into, let me tell you, God is not out to blame you because he knows you can't change yourself. Neither am I out to blame you. No one in their right senses should blame you. If you have children who are stuck into circumstances, don't blame them. They can't change themselves. You try to pull them out, you break the legs and the lips. Right? But God can transform them. What you can do you can sacrifice for a transformation. Are we together? You can sacrifice. From a personal perspective, some of the sacrifices I do make personally, if I want to achieve something, I do prayers and fasting. That's a sacrifice, isn't it? I do giving, literary giving of money. I do. I do. In Isaiah, sorry, in Genesis 27, and I'm finishing actually, in Genesis 27 verse 2, this Isaac said to his son Esau, I am now an old man. I don't know the day of my death. Now, then get your equipment, your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you blessings. Now, that text I have brought it to us as I finish to show you what to do for a blessing and for a transformation. Esau was told by his father, get me game meat. Now, I don't know how many of you has ever hunted. Is it easy, really, to get game meat? Is it easy? No. When you're told to give me game meat, you don't know even where to get that swala or whatever it is. And the next thing, when you get it, you have to really run as fast as it is as it is learning, running. That is work. Work. You have to possess it and bring it. 
Hello? You see this woman, she's told, give me water. That means she has to fetch it and bring it. Does it, does it hit you that even what you are being told to give is not yours, but you have to go for it? You understand? That money is not yours. You have worked for it, but Jesus is telling you, give me. Amen? Give me. Now, do you think Isaac, at his old age, was really interested with game meat? Would he, would he even have a taste for it at that age? In fact, when Esau delayed, Jacob cheated his way. And you know, he never came with game meat. He came with a mutton. <laughs> and the old man enjoyed the meal because he never knew the difference between the taste of game and mutton. Not at that age. What he needed, give me. Effort. Hallelujah. I'm sending you to come back to God with effort. Amen. James says, faith without work is dead, isn't it? It is dead. Are you looking for a transformation? Jesus is saying, give me. Bring that life to me. To some of you, it will take hard work. I have seen, I have gone, I, love, I, I, like, I like going to Heaven's Gate, those of you who know Heaven's Gate. And I have seen people come. They have not known God. They have come to give their best to God. And in the process, they receive salvation. And a transformation happened. You can have it. When you'll be so tired with your situation, you'll get a transformation. Because you will need that blessing so much that you can give and give before the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, my prayer for this church this year, God is giving me a chance to lead you again now that I'm not transferred. My prayer for you is that you will experience transformation upon transformations. Amen. And I'm praying that God will penetrate into your families in amazing ways. But the Lord will be asking you, give me. So there has to be a correlation. Amen. And then you can come to me and tell me, Pastor, but I did. But God didn't do it. Then we will be inquiring from the Lord as to why. May we stand before the presence of God. Let us bow our hands. O oh God Almighty, you are challenging us to come for a transformation. But you have a standard. You are asking us to give. Not what we don't have, but what we have and what we can have. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus, grant us the spirit of giving in Jesus' name. And help us to give from our own flesh and of our own flesh, even to the material, and even our children, our husbands, and all that is precious, we bring it unto your altar. Oh God, there are places we are saying we cannot. We have cried for too long. But as we hear your word, we pray in Jesus' name, perform a miracle. And we set ourselves to give by faith that Lord, you will bring a transformation. Even as we close our eyes, I want each one of us to really tell the Lord, I'm going to give. But then the most, the most precious giving is where you confess your life. You offer your life to Jesus as your Savior. 
you may be here and you are into sin, you know not how to come about it. Let me tell you, there is no transformation without giving. The reason as to why people will go to heaven, it is because they will be transformed. And transformation will happen because they will have given. They are all to Jesus. If you're here, you're not born again, and you want to be connected with Jesus for salvation, raise up your hand so that we may pray with you, and the Lord Jesus will save you. Raise up your hand without fear and tell the Lord, I give, I start with my life. Do not be ashamed, for Jesus loves you. I'm asking again, you hear you're not born again, and you're saying, Jesus, I give my life to you. Do it without fear. Jesus loves you. I would like us to sing this song that says, All to Jesus I surrender. Please be interceding for yourself. Be praying for yourself so that those who would want to surrender their life to Jesus, they do so. Those who want to surrender their material to Jesus, they do so. Whatever you want to surrender before the Lord, you will do it today and you will continue doing it. But this is a call. Prison worship, please. This is a call that if you're not born again, if Jesus comes today, transformation happens because you have given your lives to him. You have a chance to offer your life for salvation. All to Jesus I surrender. I surrender.